So this talk is on uh, what, what I call the curse of economic nationalism. And, uh, and I'm going to explain, uh, explain this partly in economic theory, partly in, in some e uh, mostly American economic history also. And uh, I'm, no, I'm certainly no Murray Rothbard, but one of the, the, the Murray's lectures that I enjoyed the most, when he could stand up and just, you know, give, a, give him a topic and he'll, and, he, and, the, and this is what attracted me to Austrian economics in the first place. And it was a big combination of economic theory, political philosophy, European history, American history. Uh, and that's, that's, what, that's what he looked at as being, a, being an economist, you know, being an economic scholar. And, and I've tried to do, you know, maybe 1% of that in my career uh, of uh, being interdisciplinary like that. And so that's why my talks are a little different than just, you know, pure economic theory. But uh, so where I'm going to start is... Uh, uh, one of the one of the first speeches that Donald Trump gave on economics in 2017, in March of 2017, he went to Louisville, Kentucky, and uh, and because he wanted to quote Henry Clay, Congressman Henry Clay, and he made a speech on uh, what Henry Clay's uh, called the American system, and this was Trump's big economic nationalism speech, and uh, and uh, whoever wrote it for him. Uh, was a big fan of Henry Clay, and and also uh, Lincoln was was sort of a political descendant of Henry Clay, and so it's it's relevant today. I'm gonna even though I'm talking about history, what uh, you know, this is relevant today. The president of the United States announced in 2017 that uh, his economic program is going to be based on something called economic nationalism, and there can be different. Uh, um, interpretations of this, but there's a unique uh, American definition of economic nationalism. And I'm going to quote, uh, and it started at the time of the American founding. And I'm going to quote Murray Rothbard uh, from his book on uh, history of money and banking as, uh, as saying what was going on here. And so what was, go what was going on, I'm going way back now, I'm going to start with uh, Alexander Hamilton and, uh, in the 1780s. And so, uh, and after the American Revolution, Hamilton, who was George Washington's assistant in the revolution, you know, very precocious, uh, uh, but I think the scientific word would be butt kisser for uh, Hamilton, but how Hamilton got to be as 22 years old, George Washington's assistant in the Revolutionary War. And, uh, but, but anyway, he, uh, he decided, well, I'm no longer gonna work for George Washington, so I'd like to work for the richest man in America, Sir Robert Morris. So he writes Morris a letter uh, you know, about uh, basically applying for the job of Treasury Secretary. And at the same time, he wrote a letter to a senator, a, a future senator, Timothy Pickering, who would be uh, uh, George Washington's Secretary of State and Sec Secretary of War. And Pickering was known to know something about finance. He was a finance guy and a senator from Massachusetts eventually. And so uh, and Pickering sent him some pamphlets, some sort of British mercantilist uh, pamphlets about protectionism and, and a few other things. And that was the, the extent of Alexander Hamilton's economic education, <laughs> these mercantilist pamphlets. But if they were enough for him to be able to compose a letter to Robert Morris saying, I, you know, I agree with you that we need protectionist tariffs. We need a bank modeled after the Bank of England. And, and we need subsidies for the road building corporations and, and things so that you, Mr. Morris, can, the richest man in America, uh, can, can, uh, Robert Morris, can, uh, can get your, your goods to, uh, to market. Okay, and so, uh, like I said, he was a, a very good butt kisser. And, and it worked. So Robert Morris uh, contacts George Washington and recommends Hamilton to be se a Treasury Secretary and according to Ron Chernow, the big Pulitzer Prize winning biographer of Hamilton, George Washington turned to uh, Hamilton and said, I didn't know you knew anything about finance. We never talked about it. But, but if Mr. Morris wants you to be the Treasury Secretary, you've got the job. So that's how I got the job. Okay, I think that's the, uh, the facial mask police coming into town, coming to Auburn uh, there. So, and here's what Murray said about it, Murray Rothbard. He said what they were up to. So you have this cabal of uh, Morris and the New York, Philadelphia, Boston, big business of the day, you know, whatever big business was, uh, cartel of the day. And they were using Hamilton as their emissary, as he was their man in the government. And, uh, and Murray said this, 
What they wanted was, quote, to reimpose in the new United States a system of mercantilism and big government similar to that of Great Britain against which the colonists had rebelled. The object was to have a strong central government, particularly a strong president or king as chief executive, built up by high taxes and heavy public debt. The strong government was to impose high tariffs to subsidize domestic manufacturers, develop a big navy to open up and subsidize foreign markets for American exports, open up at gunpoint, I assume that means, well, well, as soon as you need a navy, you're not going to persuade people to buy your wheat, you're going to aim a cannon at them to buy your wheat. Uh, for American exports and launch a massive system of internal public works, which means government subsidized road and canal building at the time. In short, the United States was to have a British system without Great Britain, end quote. That's Murray Rothbard. Another part of the plan, Rothbard said, was, quote, to organize and head a central bank to provide cheap credit and expanded money for himself, Morris, and his allies with the help of his youthful disciple, Alexander Hamilton. So Murray called uh, Hamilton Morris's youthful disciple. And so that, that was the birth of what's called economic nationalism, which is really has always been a synonym for mercantilism, British mercantilism, which is basically a collection of policies that benefits uh, produ- political policies that benefits producers at the expense of consumers and everybody else. That's sort of a short one-line definition that Murray Rothbard gave in one of his publications, actually. Okay, and so so what was the uh, the result of this? I'm going to talk about some of the results of this, of what happened, the development of economic nationalism, and uh, and the opponents of it, and why I, I call it a curse. You know, I, in fact, I called my book <clears throat> on Hamilton, Hamilton's Curse, because there was a book that was sort of annoying to me by uh, John Steel Gordon called Hamilton's Blessing. It was about public debt being a blessing. So I thought, that I, I just didn't like that. So I wrote a whole book uh, trashing the whole idea of Hamilton's blessing, uh, as far as that goes. So uh, <clears throat> but I'm going to start with the public debt. Um, here's here's you know, stark contrast in thinking about public debt and borrowing. And this, and this by the way, the, the, the view of Hamilton and, and people and his supporters on the public debt was pure mercantilism. It was, it was, you know, certainly early Keynesianism, really, sort of the glorification of government borrowing. And here's a quote from Hamilton. A national debt, if it is not excessive, will be to us a public blessing. That's where Hamilton, you know, Hamilton's blessing comes from, a national debt. Of course, Hamilton himself spent the rest of his life trying to explode the public debt as much as possible even though he said for public consumption, if it's not too excessive. But he did everything he could when he was Treasury Secretary to make sure that public debt was excessive as possible. And I'll, I'll, I'll read a quote about that uh, you know, later. Compare that to Jefferson. I had a, a Jefferson quote on the same topic. Now, Jefferson's position on public debt was that it's legitimate for the government to borrow money but it should never be more than a 20-year bond because that was a generation, you know, generation in those days, 20 years. So he said it was immoral for one generation to impose a debt burden on the future generation. And that view prevailed in America. It was a very powerful view, basically until uh, World War I, you know, with ups and downs. There were, you know, ups and downs in debt. But, but uh, Andrew Jackson, for example, paid off the public debt. You know, the, there was zero national debt uh, when he was president. Here's what Jefferson said. I consider the fortunes of our republic as depending in an eminent degree on the, extinct, on the extinguishment of the public debt. So you couldn't, couldn't be more different than Hamilton. Hamilton sees it's a blessing to have more public debt. And here's Jefferson saying, no, the blessing is if we get rid of the public debt. And, so, and, that, and that sort of set the template of the debate for, for generations in, in America anyway. And of course, a lot of other countries follow suit to what goes on in America in in, uh, in history, um, <clears throat> not always, but 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 a lot of times. Okay, and so uh, uh, Hamilton's first caper, uh, the, the reason why he thought the public debt was a blessing was that he thought the Constitution was far too restrictive uh, of government, and he wanted government to be more or less unlimited as long as it was run by wise people like himself. And so uh, he was constantly complaining to George Washington that. Now, the government was too small, and so he was a ma- quite Machiavellian. His plan was to uh, 
to associate the wealthiest people in the country who would own the public debt. That's who would buy the government bonds. And therefore, they would become a powerful lobbying force for higher taxes of the government because they would want to make sure there was always enough revenue in the Treasury to pay off the principal and interest on their bonds, on their government bonds. So he's very Machiavellian about it. And that's the reason he gave. He came right out and said it. That that's, that's, that's the reason. It's not like this was some sort of secret conspiracy between him and Morris. That's... He was right. He came out and said it. I guess politicians were not weren't always as as clever liars as they are today. They sometimes just let it slip like that, which he did. And so, so one of the capers uh, that they pulled to to achieve this was the war debt, the Revolutionary War debt <clears throat> issued by the states. Uh, a lot of the veteran, a lot of the old veterans were given uh, bonds and, instead of money. Uh, as payment for being in the army. And so they were holding on to these bonds that at the time were trading between two and 10% of par value. And they had, and so the government in Washington, the government had passed a law saying that these, they were going to buy up these bonds at a hundred percent of par value, but only the insiders in the government knew this, <clears throat> but the, uh, the farmers and the rednecks in North Carolina and the, and the, and the, uh, the veterans, they didn't know this. And this was, uh, for, for all the young people in the audience, this was before the internet. So you couldn't, couldn't easily uh, find this out. And so there was a huge arbitrage opportunity here, wasn't it? You could buy up these bonds that are, that are on the market selling at 2% of par value. You, and you knowing that you could turn around in a couple of months and get 100% par value for the same bond. And so there, there was this mass exodus all up and down the eastern seaboard of of ships, wa uh, wagon trains, coaches, stagecoaches, horseback, uh, of emissaries of the politi politically connected to buy up as many of these bonds as possible from the hapless and unknowing um, Revolutionary War veterans and others who held these bonds who were glad to say, you know, it's trading at 2%, I'll give you 10%. You know, who wouldn't take that deal? You know, uh, you know, not knowing that it was going to be worth a hundred percent of value in a in a couple of months, and so that 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 was uh, one thing that happened, and this convinced uh, uh, Hamilton or Jefferson that uh, uh, what what uh, these people wanted was what he called uh, consolidation bottomed on corruption. That is, he, a consolidation, the, their real goal was a consolidated, monopolistic, highly centralized government that could impose their economic agenda on the whole country. Protectionism, corporate welfare for uh, road building and, and, uh, and canal building, and a national bank, because they knew there was, there was huge opposition to this. this. This is the British system. They just fought a revolution against this. This is not going to fly. You need coercive power to impose this. And that was always the ultimate objective. And so uh, Jefferson very cleverly understood that what was going on, he smoked them out by understanding that, well, there were many members of Congress who became extremely wealthy. We're talking millions of dollars at the time, you know, the, the, the equivalent of millions of dollars in the seven, you know, 1780s. And so uh, including Hamilton himself uh, made a, a bundle on this. And so uh, Jefferson noted in, a, in a, one of his uh, publications that this will tie these members of Congress to the Federalist Party forever. You know, whatever they want, I'll do because they're making me rich. And so if they want me to vote for uh, protectionist tariffs, a national bank, all this, I'm your man. Okay, And so that's what was, what was going on there. And of course, you know, this established, uh, you know, sort of the, the virtues of, of, a, of a public debt is, is what uh, Hamilton was promoting. And, and the fiscal illusion that goes along with it, you know, the, 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 there's a, a sort of a public choice term is that whenever government borrows money instead of taxing you to pay for what it, the things that it's doing, it, uh, it disguises the true cost of government somewhat because it's able to, uh, most people don't see it, uh, you know, until later, you know, okay. And so that's one of the things that's going on. And uh, another thing that happens, um, is that uh, when, when a government inc inc uh, uh, imposes a debt like that, is that it tends to raise the rate of high uh, rate of time preference. Uh, Hans Hoppe has written about this in, in quite a few places that if people expect there's going to be higher taxes in the future to pay off their part of the debt, the public debt, the national debt, uh, 
then it makes uh, short-term investment, short-term consumption look uh, more attractive. Uh, if I'm going to be an investor and invest in something, I'd rather invest uh, when the government's going to take fewer taxes out of my the profits of my investment uh, now rather than in the future. And so it tends to uh, increase the rate of the rate of time preference, which is a, a bad thing for the, the future of economic growth. And so I look at this 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 debate over early debate over uh, that aspect of economic nationalism, the public debt, as it's mercantilism and it's sort of pre-Keynesianism too, isn't it? It's it's not the same argument that Keynes made by any stretch of the imagination about government borrowing, but it was an argument about the virtues of the blessings of, of national debt, okay? Um, and of course, the, the other part of economic nationalism, and maybe this is why Trump likes the phrase economic nationalism. He just uh, got the Fed to, to expand the money supply by what was it, three tr uh, three trillion dollars for for the latest uh, 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 boondoggle in Washington, was the bank, uh, the Bank of the United States, uh, the, the first central bank, uh, national bank in the United States was called the Bank of North America. And it was inflated its currency so much that, uh, that uh, within a year, uh, people had no confidence at all in the currency and it was privatized. And that was, that was the work of Morris himself. And Morris got his Bank of the United States to provide cheap credit for him and his business partners. And, and associates, and that was a big bust. And, but they didn't never gave up. Never gave up. They they gave Hamilton the assignment of resurrecting a national bank, and so uh, so he lobbied wa George Washington for that. And and Washington again asked Jefferson and Hamilton and a, and a few others to write their opinions on a constitutionality of a national bank, and it was clearly unconstitutional because the the, the American Constitutional Convention debated the issue and rejected it. And so, you know, what more evidence do you, do you need? And it's not in delegated powers in the Constitution of, of a bank. And so, you know, you think case closed, but that's when in the, Hamilton invented the idea of implied powers of the Constitution. He basically said, well, if you read between the lines, uh, uh, there's, you know, there's, there's room for a, a bank run by politicians. You know, who, who wouldn't want a bank run by politicians? You know, and put all the money in the hands of a bunch of politicians. That's, you know, who would think that's a bad idea? And, uh, and to make it a, a short story, what eventually happened uh, is uh, uh, they had this debate and George Washington at the time, they were at the time, they were about to move the national capital to Virginia and, and create Washington, D.C. And George Washington was a big land speculator and he owned all this land in Virginia. And uh, he, he told um, the Federalists in New England, who were the Hamilton's party, the Federalists, if you extend the border of uh, uh, Washington, D.C. to my property in Mount Vernon, I'll vote for the bank. And so that was the political deal that was, that was done. And so George Washington, not vote, but uh, sign off on the bank. So he signed the legislation. He didn't veto it. He signed the legislation. The Federalists had the vote. And we got the Bank of the United States, first national bank. And here's what uh, Rothbard said about the effect of this uh, the Bank of the United States promptly fulfilled its inflationary potential by issuing millions of dollars in paper money and demand deposits, pyramiding on top of $2 million in specie. Uh, the bank invested heavily in loans to the United States government, in addition to $2 million invested in the assumption of pre-existing long-term debt assumed by the new federal government. The bank engaged in massive temporary lending to the government, which reached $6.2 million by 1796. The result of the outpouring of credit and paper money by the new bank of the United States was an increase in prices you know, of 72 percent from 1791 to 1796. So 72 percent price inflation in, in five years, uh, in addition to uh, you know the boom and bust cycles that it, that it always uh, creates. And it was given a 20-year charter, and it created so much inflation and boom and bust and corruption uh, by, for example, financing one side of the political debate in America that Congress uh, did not recharter the Bank of the United States after, 20, after the first uh, 20 years. But then the War of 1812 came and they decided they needed to monetize the war debt in the, in the, of, uh, of the War of 1812. And so they created the second Bank of the United States that came into being in 1817. 
Uh, who here, you've been at Mises University for a couple days, uh, who, who here recognizes the significance of the year 1819 in, in Austrian economics? It's, you're too old. Yeah? I'm not gonna, you, you, you've been around for like years. No, go ahead, go ahead. I was one of, one of the younger students. But go ahead, tell them what's... It was a panic of 1819. Pa panic of 1819. Yeah, Murray Rothbard's doctoral dissertation, The Panic of 1819. And so my hunch is it's not just a coincidence that the Bank of the United States was resurrected in 1817, and then 1819 was the panic of 1819, two years, two years later. So the Bank of the United States did what the Bank of the United States does. And it created the panic of 1819. And, uh, and as Murray wrote, uh, there were, for the first time in American history, there was, there was massive unemployment in some of the cities. I think he, he gathered what statistics he could get. I think in Philadelphia, the, the number of jobs went from something like uh, 9,500 jobs in small manufacturing, which was basically shops where people were I don't know, manufacturing shoes or things like that. There was no electricity, so there wasn't mass production. From 9,500 to something like, 2,500, so, you know, the big, huge percentage drop off in employment in American cities from, from the, the panic. And, and back, and by the way, that's back in those days, depressions, what we today call a depression was called a panic. It was Herbert Hoover who came up with the idea that panic is a bad word. People might panic. Let's call it something nicer, like a depression. They, 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 you know, that's like, we'll call it a panic. So, uh, yeah, he was he was a clever engineer, uh, Herbert Hoover. So this, so that created, and then um, you know you know Murray Rothbard also uh, has high praise for the Jacksonians, not necessarily Jackson himself, but the Jacksonians. He considers them to be a, a, a legitimate libertarian party, the Jacksonians of uh, the early nineteenth uh, century in America. And uh, every time I say this or write this somewhere in an article. Or, or, or say anything positive about Andrew Jackson, like when he defunded the Second Bank of the United States, I get inundated with emails accusing me of defending everything he ever did in his entire life. You know, I, I don't know where this kind of logic comes from, but, but, but uh, anyway, so, but, but that's, what, that's the way it is. But so, and so Murray uh, praised, uh, not necessarily Jackson, but Jacksonians, the party uh, you know, apparatus, uh, was very libertarian. And of course, it starts with Jackson's uh, vetoing of the Bank of the United States. And so we had another 20 years of this uh, boom and bust and political corruption. They literally paid uh, retainers to Daniel Webster, the bank did, and other people to, uh, to support the bank in, in the Senate. Okay, so just so think about that. That's you know, a pretty bold uh, move there. And uh, so, but Andrew Jackson, you know, uh, it was kind of schizophrenic because as far as economic nationalism goes, it was Andrew Jackson who tried to enforce a big tariff increase from 12 or 13 percent to 48 percent in 1828. But at the same time, he, he vetoed the Bank of the United States. So he, he supported the protectionist tariff, but then he, he killed uh, the Bank uh, of, the, of the United States. But he was a supporter of the protectionism for a while also. But here's, um, here's what he said when he'd vetoed the, the uh, rechartering of the Bank of the United States. I'll read just a part of this, his statement, Andrew Jackson. He said, it is to be regretted that the rich and powerful too often bend the acts of government to their selfish purposes. Distinctions in society will always exist under every just government. Equality of talents, of education, or wealth cannot be produced by human institutions but every man is equally entitled to protection by law, rule of law. Uh, but when the laws undertake to add these natural and just advantages, artificial distinctions to grant titles, gratuities, and exclusive privileges to make the rich richer and the potent more powerful, the humble members of society who have neither the time nor the means of securing like, flavor, like favors to themselves, favors from government, remember, he's saying, have a right to complain of the injustice of their government. If government would confine itself to equal protection, it would be an unqualified blessing. In the act before me, that is to recharter the Bank of the United States, there seems to be a wide and unnecessary departure from these just principles. So he, he pretty much condemned it as thoroughly corrupt and vetoed the rechartering, and the Bank of the United States eventually uh, went out of business over the next several years uh, as a result of that.
And so that was uh, one, of, one of the high points in American history. I think uh, uh, Andrew Jackson vetoing the rechartering of the Bank of the United States. Okay. Uh, another thing that, uh, another part of uh, um, economic nationalism, protectionism, uh, Hamilton, again, it's, it's amazing how, how many bad ideas came from Hamilton. And uh, uh, just, uh, I mentioned yesterday at our Q&A session that uh, last week, uh, the New York Post reporter called me on the phone because uh, they had, you know, she had seen my book on Hamilton. This is uh, this book here. And uh, they were doing a story on, on Alexander Hamilton since I guess this, this musical, this Broadway musical is now gonna be on television. So it makes it an issue, I guess. And she, wanted, she was writing an article on would Hamilton be a Democrat or Republican? She wanted to know. Well, to, and the, that's a good question. I thought, on the one hand, he's sort of like a, a Pat Buchanan Republican on economics, which is, you know, total nonsense. You know, you know e uh, an economic doofus, uh, you know, on, on economics. And uh, so I told her that uh, he would probably be more like a Ted Kennedy Democrat, but not a crazy socialist Bernie Sanders Democrat. And they quoted that in the New York Post. They had that, and they they provided a link to my book too. So I probably sold one or two books uh, to that. But but he came. Hamilton it was Hamilton who invented the uh, the infant industries argument for protectionism that uh, new industries need protection with tariffs and subsidies or else they can't compete with the older British industries uh, of, of the day and, uh, and, so, and so forth. And, uh, and he had a lot of really other really, uh, and, and that of course, you know, all industries are infants at some point. You know, how did the British industries become so big and dominant? Uh, they were infants at some point. They didn't always have, always have, all have protectionism and subsidies to, to, to grow up. You just ignore that. And he, he made some other uh, arguments. He said this, quote, transportation is an evil which ought to be minimized. That is, is we should not allow, uh, we should minimize transportation of goods from Europe to America, for example, uh, or for that matter, from Pennsylvania to Maryland, or from Alabama to Tennessee, you know, should minimize transportation. And, and Abe Lincoln, when decades later, would repeat the same thing about the evils of transportation cost. Okay, sounds very much like Douglas North, doesn't it? So the transactions cost, you know, e e uh, economics, the evils of transactions cost. Uh, and he also they also made the argument that uh, prot uh, with high protectionist tariffs would cause lower prices somehow. That uh, if you just protect them from foreign competition, they would compete among themselves, and that would drive prices down. So all these businesses that are supposedly lobbying for protectionism do so because they think they will be able to charge lower prices if they get protectionist tariffs. That's basically Hamilton's argument, and Abe Lincoln repeated the same thing. He also came out in favor of uh, the idea that uh, uh, anything... Only things that cannot be grown or manufactured in the United States should be allowed to be imported to the United States. So if we can't grow coffee in North America, then we can import coffee. But if we can make shoes, there should be no shoe imports at all, zero imports at all. And, and once again, his political heir, Abe Lincoln, made the exact same argument for, for protectionist tariffs also. And so believe it or not, this, this was sort of the original template uh, you know, sort of theoretical template for protectionism uh, of Hamiltonian uh, mercantilism. Uh, and it was repeated over and over and over and over again. And so as far as the, the curses, so, so by the time you get to uh, 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 Jackson's day, uh, there's an interesting story that, that I'll tell related to, you know, Jackson vetoes the Bank of the United States so that the Hamiltonians, uh, the mercantilists are failing and yeah, they're not getting this. And so finally, uh, you know, Hamilton is long gone, and it was Henry Clay who picked up the mantle of mercantilism, uh, which is why Trump went to Louisville, Kentucky, to give his first economic speech uh, uh, and, and quoted Henry Clay, he praised Henry Clay literally to the treetops in, in Louisville, Kentucky. And so Clay was the man. And he's credited with uh, inventing what was called the American system, although it was really Hamilton who used that phrase. And of course, it's really the British system, uh, you know, come to America is what it was. But they finally got their man. They finally, uh, 
uh, elected my and Lou's favorite president, William Henry Harrison, right, Lou? That's you. Uh, who uh, who died one month after taking office? That's, that's <laughs> William Henry Harrison. He died, and but he was a Whig, and uh, Henry Clay and the Whig Party. They their man was in the White House. They controlled Congress. They're finally going to get protectionist tariffs, internal improvement subsidies, and the national bring back the National Bank. The vice president was John Tyler, who was a, a states' rights Jeffersonian. He vetoed everything. He vetoed everything. So they kicked John Tyler out of the Whig Party. They burned him in effigy in front of the White House. And, uh, and uh, Henry Clay threw the mother of all hissy fits over the whole thing. And, uh, and, he, and it probably caused him to die 10 years earlier than he normally would have passed away from, from all this. Because it was quite the calamity for, for them. But John Tyler saved the day. And, and that, by the way, is, has a lot to do with why there's a book called Recarving Rushmore. That ranks American presidents by Ivan Eland, E L A N D, and uh, and unlike all the history professors, all the history professors who write books that rank presidents, their criteria are usually whoever taxes, spends, and borrows the most and gets gets the most people killed in wars. That's that's who's at the top. That's why Wilson, FDR, Lincoln are all uh, are always at the top. But Ivan Eland's uh, criterion is. Whoever does the best job at protecting constitutional liberty, and his number one president is John Tyler. He ranks John Tyler number one. That's why you've never heard of John Tyler. You, you know, you know, so he's, he calls him the most libertarian of all presidents, Ivan Elon. He works for the Independent Institute in California, in Oakland, California, or at least he used to. I don't know if he's still there or not, but at the time the book was written, he was associated with uh, David Thoreau's uh, Independent Institute out there. And so anyway, uh, that, that's what happened. So in, at the same time, you had, uh, here's Jackson vetoing the Bank of the United States. Hold your applause, please. And then uh, the, the Whigs thought they, they had been making a comeback. They elected their man, and John Tyler comes in. And, uh, and so, you know, Andrew Jackson and John Tyler were huge heroes for those acts in, uh, at that time of history, with each sort of about 10 years apart that, that this happened. Uh, and so, uh, but they never give up. You know, they, they, the the uh, the 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 uh, sources of uh, political greed and rent seeking and plunder uh, never give up. And so they move to the states. Now, the states, state governments all over the United States, beginning in the 1830s, started using state tax dollars for road and canal building, and some very minor railroad subsidies, but nothing really, nothing hardly, but road and canal building. And uh, and Abe Lincoln was he was the leader of the uh, Whigs in the, in the Illinois legislature, and they, they got them to, to allocate eleven million dollars at the time was huge for road building, canal building, and nothing was finished in Illinois. Not not one road was completed, so all the roads were roads to nowhere. They never never completed, and all the canals were canals to nowhere, never completed. And this happened in state after state after state, and it created so such a calamity that that all these the taxpayers were saddled with all this debt that they had to pay off, that by the time you get to 1860, you know, the eve of the American Civil War, every state in the United States had amended its constitution to, to make it illegal for, to use tax dollars for a, to a corporation to do anything. Only Massachusetts had not done so. By the time you get to 1860, Massachusetts was the only state to have not amended its constitution, not just pass a law, but amend his constitution and say that no state tax dollars can go to a corporation for road building or anything else. And, and that was, and so, so that, so they failed again, they failed again. Uh, but another success they had uh, temporarily was the tariff of abominations. There's another economic nationalism plank. In 1828, they managed, the Whigs managed to raise the average tariff rate to 48%. And uh, South Carolina was the biggest, the biggest opponents. And uh, the South Carolinians uh, had passed a nullification law that said, we're not going to collect this. And, and this law actually allocated $160,000, the equivalent of $160,000 in 1832, you know, early 1830s, for the governor of South Carolina to purchase firearms with which to fend off federal tax collectors. So there was almost a, a war, a, a war of secession in 1828 to 1832 
that, that occurred there. They were serious. Part of this law also said that if any federal tax collector showed up in South Carolina, that he would have all of his personal possessions and properties uh, confiscated and it would be imprisoned. And so that, that was a bit of a deterrent, I would think, to taking the job of a tax collector in, uh, in South Carolina. And so they were serious. Uh, uh, and Jackson, as I said, he was sort of schizophrenic on this. He threatened to send warships. He didn't. Uh, Lincoln did 30 years later, but he didn't. And so they negotiated. They ended up negotiating uh, a, a lower tariff after that, the lower the tariff after that period of, uh, of time. So that by the time you get to uh, 1860, the eve of the American Civil War, the average tariff rate in America was 15% which is uh, said to be the high watermark of free trade in America in that century, in the 19th century in America, as far as that goes. And so they, they failed again. They, they tried that version of it. Okay. But then uh, Lincoln comes along, gets elected president, and all of this, all of this is voted into, into, into policy. Uh, he raised tariffs 10 times. The Civil War is over. The average tariff rate is in a 50 percent range, not 15 percent. And it stayed there until 1913 when the income tax came in. Uh, they, had, they began the massive subsidies of the railroad corporations, finally, even though the states had had these, these awful experiences, including Illinois, with uh, subsidies. And they, they subsidized the railroads. And, uh, and of course, that led to the, the greatest uh, political scandal in American history up to that point, the Credit Mobilier scandal. Uh, re related to uh, corruption of uh, the, the government subsidized railroads, and and, uh, and so this is a, I'll, I'll show you how it was spelled. I'm not a French speaker, but I've heard people say this word. It's, uh, it was the name of a company. What 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 they did? What these characters did? These politicians is. They were in charge of running the government-subsidized transcontinental railroad project, building transcontinental railroads. And uh, let me get this out of here. And uh, they would set up companies that would say uh, sell uh, iron rails. And iron rails say say you could buy an iron rail for a dollar on the free market. Uh, they would use government money to pay themselves a hundred dollars for the same iron rail. And they would bribe members of Congress to go along with it by giving them shares of stock with the insider information that all of a sudden this company is going to be worth a fortune once we start paying ourselves 100 bucks for an iron rail when you could buy, you normally buy for 100. And this went on for years until finally uh, there was some big argument between some of the conspirators. And one of them got so ticked off that he told a journalist, he spilled the beans to a journalist, so it all blew up and then... And the, you know the American Secretary of State was involved in it, and, and, and all. So it was a big, as the Jeffersonians always predicted, and also they built they built uh, you know probably the, the worst built railroads in in the world, the the, the government subsidized railroads. Here's I've drawn a map of what I think would be a, an example of the roots of the government subsidized railroads. In the, there's a map of America, and the roots are kind of like that. And the reason, the reason they were kind of like that was that every member of Congress in that part of the country insisted, if you're, gonna, if, I'm gonna, if you're gonna get my vote, you need to run a line to my district. Even if there's two people a year that ride the train, you gotta, if you want my vote, there's gonna be a, a line to my. So that's what they did. And uh, there was one man who did not do this. James J. Hill built the Great Northern Railroad and, uh, and uh, with no, no uh, subsidies, not even land grants. And of course, there were huge government land grants to the subsidized ones. And that's my map of James J. Hill's route. You could look these up on the web. You could look up the Great Northern Railroad route, and you can see it looks kind of like this. And then you could uh, uh, Google the uh, 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 Union Pacific Railroad route, railroad route, and it really does look something like that. It really does look something like that. And so they built, and these are all the kind of things that, the Jeffersonians had been predicting this is inevitable would happen uh, if you if you go this this way. So that's that's a, that was another curse of um, as I call it curse of uh, economic nationalism in in American history. And uh, speaking of, I was on vacation in Montana a couple of years ago, and uh, we went to a 
northern Montana. I was in Yellowstone for a while, and they went five miles, five hours drive north of that. And we went into a small town, and I, and I sat down. There was a there was a restaurant that had sort of a second floor balcony. You can sit out there and have lunch. I went out there, and uh, there's train tracks there, and parked in a train was a Great Northern Railroad train. And so this was just a couple of years ago, but this was the 1870s. It's still there. It's still operating, the Great, the Great Northern. It's James J. Hill's uh, thing. I think uh, he... Uh, the rumor has it that he was uh, one of the main figures in uh, the novel Atlas Shrugged that was 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 uh, uh, modeled after James J. Hill. Well, anyway, uh, you know, fast forward, more economic nationalism, the New Deal. The New Deal, uh, which was really started by Herbert Hoover. He didn't call it the New Deal. But in my in my book on capitalism, How Capitalism Saved America, I quote Rexford Tugwell, who was FDR's main uh, economic policy advisor for 12 years, uh, as, uh, for, or for the whole duration of the Roosevelt administration, as saying they really just took what Hoover was doing and expanded on it. They took basically the same ideas. He, they just went much further than the kind of things Hoover was doing. And of course, he signed off on the Smoot-Hawley tariff, which increased the average tariff rate up to uh, almost just under 60%. It was like 59.6% was the average tariff rate. And keeping in mind that you know, it had gone from 15% back in the day to, to that. And that spawned an international tariff war that reduced the, the, the value of world trade by two-thirds in three years, uh, the Smoot-Hawley tariff. So that was another curse that happened that came, you know, let's talk about Hamilton's curse, you know, another mercantilist curse. And then uh, the, the first New Deal was uh, Hamiltonian corporate welfare. It was the, the National Recovery Act imposed price, price floors on just about everything, all manufactured goods and all farm goods, all agricultural goods, price floors. And so they even had, they hired thousands of price control police to, uh, to uh, uh, fine or even jail people for cutting prices because they thought the Great Depression was caused by low prices. <laughs> <laughs> that was Roosevelt's theory of the cause of the Great Depression. So if we only get the government to force up prices, we'll end the Great Depression. It was their thinking, and I need not say, say more about that. And so, and then, that, and of course, you know, that led to decades of crony capitalism. At the same era, same era, the early 20th century, we had all the so-called natural monopolies created by government fiat, government franchise monopolies. And once they gave the electric power industry and the telephone industry natural monopoly. I always hated that word, natural. There's nothing natural about it. It's government-created monopoly. Natural is, was the free market, was the opposite of the free market. You know, it's like kind of like jumbo shrimp, isn't it? You know, military intelligence. It's, it's contradiction in, in, in terms. But, uh, but once they gave these companies, uh, these industries, uh, monopoly status, everybody, the, the real estate industry, the dairy industry, everybody, well, I'm a natural monopoly too, you know, and we want to eliminate competition. But that was economic nationalism. That was, there are books written. There's a guy named uh, Lind, who's an uh, author, who's written a big book of uh, essays on economic nationalism, but he's praising economic nationalism. He's a sort of a Pat Buchanan type on, on this. And he praises the FDR as, as, as the way to go. And, uh, and of course, we know now that the, the so-called New Deal policies uh, caused the Great Depression to be uh, much longer and much deeper than it otherwise would have been, even the mainstream economics. Of course, the Austrians knew this all along. But uh, one of my old articles in the free market, probably about 10 years ago now, was I was surprised to see in the Journal of Political Economy, one of the big economics journals, that a couple of big shots, including the editor of the American Economic Review, had published an article in the JPE saying that the Great Depression actually made the, uh, or the New Deal actually made the Great Depression longer lasting and more severe. The same thing the Austrians had been saying for decades and decades. And Richard Vedder and Lowell Galloway said the same thing maybe 10 or 15 years before these guys did in, in their book, uh, Out of Work, but they just ignored all that. And so, uh, so anyway, so maybe I'll stop there. That's my sort of uh, uh, talk about uh, economic nationalism and why I think it's a curse. I hope you learned something about where it comes from, the ideas that guided it. And, and they're still alive today with the president of the United States calls himself an economic nationalist.
he doesn't know what it means really, but he's, he still calls him, he still calls himself an economic nationalist. Someone told him Henry Clay was a neat guy, I guess. But uh, so he does. And so, um, I don't know, do we have a few minutes for questions? If anybody has questions, comments, uh, high praise or anything like that, uh, it's, it's not required. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, other than the National Bank, were there a lot of uh, Hamilton protectionist ideas that were enacted right off the bat? Protectionist ideas? You mean yeah. tariffs? Uh, well, uh, no, he, he succeeded with the National Bank. That, that was his big success in terms of economic policy. But, uh, but everything, everything else, you know, James Madison, uh, when he became president, uh, you know, Jefferson was president from 1800 to 1808 was the, you know, the last year. And Hamilton was dead. He died in, eight, in uh, 1804. Yeah. He, got, he was in a famous duel with Aaron Burr. And uh, Gary North once told me that he once started an Aaron Burr Society, and their logo, and their logo was not soon enough. Was, <laughs> was, but 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 uh, but he, so he was dead. But but Hamilton then Ham or Madison becomes president after Jefferson, and the very last thing he did was to veto an internal improvements bill. There was a, there was a bill that was supposedly a a, a bill to give. Uh, pensions to soldiers from the War of 1812 or something like that. And there was a rider in it that would have provided a small amount of money, at the, even at the time, for road building. And Madison said, this is not, you'll have to amend the Constitution before you did that. And so, and president after president vetoed until the Civil War, uh, internal, Andrew Jackson vetoed uh, internal improvement subsidies, uh, you know. And so, uh, and, and, the, and John Quincy Adams uh, said uh, the uh, the greatest uh, defeat of his presidency was he didn't get these passed, <clears throat> and he and he blamed uh, John C. Calhoun. He called him the evil, uh, evil genius of the South because he was uh, against this, this sort of thing. Because there was a tension, you know, Southerners uh, and <clears throat> they didn't want to pay taxes to have a railroad built in the North, and vice versa. Northerners didn't want to pay taxes if the, if the route was to be in the South. So there was a big controversy over that. <clears throat> but they didn't get any of that stuff. They, they, 1824, they got a tariff increase, and that encouraged them to go further and, and pass the Tariff of Abominations four years later. But that was long after uh, Hamilton's day uh, was over. But the bank, you know, the bank was his big thing. They didn't get any internal improvements. Jefferson's... Uh, Treasury Secretary was in favor of internal improvement subsidies, but Jefferson told him we would have to amend the Constitution first. So the, the strict constructionists were serious strict constructionists in those days about the Constitution. And he didn't say we, we shouldn't have internal improvements. He said you have to amend the Constitution first if you want them. But, uh, but then Hamilton uh, died. And, uh, and he, but his heirs, uh, John Marshall was his, the Chief Justice was his... Uh, real powerful political descendant. And, and he promoted Hamilton's view. He's, he's the one, Hamilton also invented the idea that the states, I don't know if he invented it, but he popularized the idea that the states were never sovereign. They never really delegated powers to the government. It was the other way around. The federal government is sovereign. And John Marshall did a great deal as chief justice for 36 years to repeat that over and over again, to sort of lay the groundwork for a, when Abe Lincoln came along to repeat the same lie that uh, the states didn't ratify the Constitution. The, con uh, the late Joe Sobern said that made as much sense that, you know, that the union created the states makes as much sense as saying a marital union can be older than either spouse. You know, how can that be? <laughs> you, know, you know, so anyway, so that's the answer to your question, long-winded answer to your question. Any other questions or comments? Uh, thank you for not snoring while I was talking. That was uh, the first time in several days. So, uh, and that'll be it for today. You can, uh, you're free to go.